Hey everybody, welcome to day 76 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. It's so good to be with you again today. Uh, we're going to be looking at Joshua chapters 18 through 20 today, which has a great lesson in it about living up to our potential. Malcolm Gladwell, an author, has described what he calls the smartest man in the world. This man got a perfect score on his SAT test when he was in high school, even though he literally fell asleep for part of it and still got a perfect score. Um, He also has been given IQ tests and we think his IQ is at something like 195, which is basically off the charts. That is, it's hard to get an accurate uh, IQ reading for him because nobody else is like him. Uh, To give an example, uh, Einstein and Stephen Hawking they are about 160 and this man is about 195. In his uh, foreign language class in high school, he would just show up for class a couple minutes before the instructor, look over his notes, and he would ace all of the tests. Um, Esquire magazine profiled him in 1999 and said, IQs like this exist among us at the rate of roughly one in 100 million. So, I mean, nobody is like him. He's, he's amazing. He got a scholarship to college, and he went to a college in Oregon, but his mother was very poor and uneducated, and she didn't fill out the appropriate forms to keep his scholarship going for his second year of college, and so he was dropped. And when he found out it was too late, he couldn't get reinstated with his scholarship, and he was so disgusted, he didn't even finish that year of school. And he dropped out. He got low Fs on his transcripts. And then he didn't go to school at all for a little while. And then eventually he went to Montana State University. Um, But he had car problems and he had morning classes in math and philosophy. and, And he couldn't make it anymore because of his transportation problems, but there was a rancher who said he would take this fellow to class if he could do his classes in the afternoon. And the same classes were offered in the afternoon, so he went to the administrators and said, could I please just be transferred to the afternoon classes? And um, the dean just lectured him and said, everyone has to make sacrifices to get an education, and they wouldn't transfer him. And he was so disgusted with how the people didn't care about his scholarship in the previous school, and they don't care about transferring him in this school. He was so disgusted. He said, and that was the point I decided I could do without the higher education system. It was sufficiently repugnant to me that I wouldn't do it anymore. So I dropped out of college, simple as that. And then he just started doing normal jobs, ordinary jobs, factory, uh, working on a fishing boat, uh, being a barroom bouncer. And then eventually in his 50s, uh, he got his his own uh, horse ranch, uh, but it's, it's meager and he's married and I think he's happy enough. But what happened is this fellow who has a one in a hundred million uh, mind has lived an ordinary life and mostly has become an example of wasted potential. So today we're going to talk about fulfilling your potential, and you can. And so Joshua chapters 18 through 20. As we read some of the names and that sort of thing, I I know I've stumbled at some of these a few times, so I'm sorry for stumbling and thank you for being patient with me. This is Joshua chapter 18 verse 1 in the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said to the children of Israel, How long will you put off going to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? Give out from among you three men for each tribe, and I will send them, and they shall rise and go through the land and describe it according to the inheritance of them, and they shall come again to me, and they shall divide it into seven parts. Judah shall abide in the coast on the south, and the house of Joseph shall remain in the coast on the north. You shall therefore describe the land in seven parts and bring the description here to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no portion among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance, and Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance on the other side of Jordan, on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. 
And the men rose and went away, and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it, and come again to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven portions in a book, and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord. And there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. And the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families. And the coast of their lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. And their border on the north side was from Jordan. And the border went up to the side of Jericho on the north side and went up through the mountains westward. And the end of it was at the wilderness of beth And the border went over from there toward Luz, to the side of Luz, which is Bethel, southward. And the border descended to Adaroth Adar, near the hill that lies on the south side of the lower Beth Horon. And the border was drawn from there and rounded the corner of the sea southward from the hill that lies before Beth Horon, southward. And the end of it is... Kirjath Baal, which is Kirjath Jerim, a city of the children of Judah. This was the west quarter. And the south quarter was from the end of Kirjath Jerim, and the border went out on the west and went out to the well of waters of Naphtoah. And the border came down to the end of the mountain that lies before the valley of the son of Hinnom, and which is in the valley of the giants on the north, and descended to the valley of Hinnom to the side of Jebusai on the south, and descended to Enrogel, and was drawn from the north and went forth to En Shemesh, and went forth toward Galiloth, which is over against the going up of Adumim, and descended to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben and passed along toward the side across from Araba northward and went down unto Araba. And the border passed along to the side of Beth Hogla northward. And the ends of the border were at the north bay of the Salt Sea at the south end of Jordan. This was the south coast. And Jordan was the border of it on the east side. This was the inheritance of the children of Benjamin by the coasts of it all around according to their families. And the cities of the tribe of the children of Benjamin according to their families were Jericho and Beth Hagla and the valley of Kizis and Beth Araba and Zemarim and Bethel and Avim and Pera and Ophrah and Kephar Haim Monai and Ophni and Geba, twelve cities with their villages. Gibeon and Ramah and Beeroth and Mizpah and Kephira and Moza and Rechem and Erpiel and Terala and Zila, Eleph and Jebusai, which is Jerusalem, uh, Gibeath and Kirjath, 14 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Benjamin according to their families. Chapter 19. And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families, and their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. And they had in their inheritance Beersheba, or Sheba, and Molada, and uh, Hazar Shuel, and Bela, and Ezem, and El Tolad, and Bethuel, and Horma, and Ziklag, and Bethmar Keboth, and Hazar Susa, and Bethabaoth, and Sheruhen, thirteen cities and their villages. Aen, Remen, and Ether, and Ashan, four cities and their villages. And all the villages that were round about these cities to Baalath, Beer, uh, Ramath of the south, this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Simeon according to their families. Out of the portion of the children of Judah was the inheritance of the children of Simeon. For the part of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance inside the inheritance of them. And the third lot came up for the children of Zebulun according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was unto Sarad. And their border went up toward the sea, and Merilah, and reached to Debesheth, and reached to the river that is before Jachnaim, and turned from Sarad eastward toward the sunrise unto the border of Kisloth Tabor, and then goes down to Debarath, and goes up to Jephiah. 
and from there passes on along the east to Gidala Hefer and Ita Kazin and goes out from Remen Mithoar to Nia. And the border turns on the north side to Hanathon, and the end of it is in the valley of Jephthahel. And Kadath and Nehalal and Shimron and Edelah and Bethlehem, twelve cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the children of Zebulun according to their families, these cities with their villages. And the fourth lot came out to Issachar for the children of Issachar according to their families. And their border was toward Jezreel and Chezuloth and Shunem and Hapharaim and Shiran and Anath Harath and Rabith and Kishion and Abez and Ramath and Enganim and Enhada and Beth Pazes. And the coast reaches uh, to Tabor and Shehazima and Beth Shemesh, and of their end was at Jordan, 16 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Issachar, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. And the fifth lot came out for the tribe of the children of Asher, according to their families, and their border was Helkath and Halai and Beten and Akshaph and Elam Melech and Amon and Mishael, and reaches to Carmel westward, and to Shihor Libnath, and turns toward the sunrise to Beth Dagon, and reaches Zebulun, and to the valley of Jephthahel, uh, toward the north side of Beth Emek and Nile, and goes out to Cable on the left side, and Hebron, and Rehab, and Hammon, and Cana, even to the great Zidon. And then the coast turns to Ramah, and to the strong city Tyre, and the coast turns to Hosra, and the end of it is the coast of Akzib. Uma also, and Aphek, and Rehab, 22 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Asher, according to their families, these cities with their villages. The sixth lot came to the children of Naphtali, even for the children of Naphtali, according to their families. And their coast was from Heleph, from Elon to Zaanaim, and Adamai, and Nekeb, and Jabnael, unto Lakum, and the end of it is Jordan. And then the coast turns west word toward Asnoth Tabor and goes out from there to Hukok and reaches Zebulun on the south side and reaches to Asher on the west side and to Judah upon Jordan toward the sunrise. And the fenced cities are Zedem, Zer, and Hamath, Rakath, Kinnereth, and Adamah, and Ramah, and Hazor, and Kadesh, and Edrei, and, and Hazor, and Iron, and Migdal El and Horam, and Bethanath, and Beth Shemesh, 19 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Naphtali, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. And the seventh lot came out for the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families. And the coast of their inheritance was Zorah, and Eshtael, and Urshemesh, and Shea Laban, and Agilon, and Jethla, and Elon, and Thimnatha, and Ekron, and Elteca, and Gibithon, and Baalath, and Jehud, and Benabirak, and Gathrimon, and Mejarkon, and Rakon, with the border before Japho. The coast of the children of Jan, Dan came out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Lashem and took it and struck it down with the edge of the sword and possessed it and resided in it and called Lashem Dan, after the name of Dan their father. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Dan according to their families, these cities with their villages when they made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coasts. The children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath Sira in Mount Ephraim, and he built the city and resided in it. These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they made an end of dividing the country. Chapter 20. 
The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer who kills any person accidentally and unwittingly may flee there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he who flees unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city to them and give him a place that he may reside among them. And if the avenger of blood pursues after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he struck down his neighbor accidentally and did not hate him before. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then the slayer shall return and come to his own city, unto his own house, unto the city from where he fled." And they appointed Kedish in Galilee, in Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kerjath Erba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. And on the other side of Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness upon the plain of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead, out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan, out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourns among them, and whoever kills any person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. And that ends Joshua chapter 20. Well, again, we had a lot of place names in there, so thank you for being patient with me. And now we've been talking about all of these places that have been conquered and inhabited by the Jewish people, the Israelites, after they came into the Promised Land. Uh, what you might not realize, but maybe you do realize uh, by reading all of that, is that uh, the Israelites never conquered the entire Promised Land. Remember way back in the book of Exodus chapter 23, verse 31, we were told that the boundaries of the land would be roughly these. So remember, you go to the Red Sea and you have the two little bunny ears that stick up. The right side is the Gulf of Aqaba. So you draw a diagonal line from the Gulf of Aqaba across the desert to the Euphrates River. And then the Euphrates River is the boundary all the way up almost to the top of where the Euphrates River meets the Mediterranean Sea. And then you start at the Gulf of Aqaba. Again, the bunny ear on the right-hand side, Gulf of Aqaba. You draw a diagonal line to the chin of the Mediterranean Sea. And up the seacoast you go almost all the way to the top of the seacoast, maybe above the seacoast coast, it's hard to tell, but at the top of the Mediterranean Sea, the Euphrates has gotten close, and you just draw a little line across there, and that's your border. So basically, you have a crooked triangle, a crooked wedge of pizza, and it's huge. Today, that would include, in, in modern day nations, that would include basically all the modern nation of Jordan. And Jordan is the nation just on the east side of the Jordan River to Israel, which is on the left side. So today, all of Jordan would be absorbed into Israel. It has a substantial fraction of Iraq because Iraq bleeds out and over the Euphrates River and uh, Israel gets the boundary line right up to the bank of the Euphrates. So anything that leans over the Euphrates River in Iraq, that's, that's really Israel's territory. And then the same thing with Syria. Two-thirds of Syria is basically leaning over the Euphrates River and is in those boundaries, that, that pizza wedge. And um, so basically the land was huge. And you can see they never, that the Israelites never got anywhere close to occupying all of that land. And you can see why they might need it, right? Because somebody has calculated that the way things are just here in Joshua, maybe every Israelite had something like 20 acres of land, which is all well and good. But when I die, let's say I have two sons, then I am now going to leave my acres to my two sons. They don't have 20 acres each. They only have 10 acres each. And the next generation worse. And so you have to conquer all the land. You, ha you have to have more land or this is never going to work in the long run. But what really happened is they didn't finish conquering the land at all. And that's just sad. Um, we noticed in chapter 18, verse 1, that the tabernacle has been set up in Shiloh. Remember, Moses kept saying, uh, the place that the Lord shall choose, 
that will be the place where you do your sacrifices and your tabernacle worship. And the Lord chose Shiloh. It's centrally located, again, just a little above Jerusalem, a nice place for everybody to go. And uh, they probably are the ones who named it Shiloh. And probably after the famous prophecy of Jacob in uh, Genesis 49.10, where Jacob says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. So they named this place Shiloh after that famous prophecy. Now, of course, the tabernacle still will move around in the next few years. Uh, it has been at Gilgal, right, before they conquered Jericho, and now it's at Shiloh. It will someday go back to Gilgal again. Uh, it will go back to Shiloh again. It will go to Mizpah. It will go to Nob. It will go to Gibeon and maybe some other places that aren't mentioned in the Bible. So the tabernacle is mobile, but mostly it's at Shiloh. It tends to be at Shiloh during these years. Now, there's something I've been wanting to talk to you about this whole time in the book of Joshua and, and even before that, but I haven't had time. And uh, I want to talk to you about the conquest of Joshua as we find it in archaeology, which is very exciting. In 1887, archaeologists discovered a cache of 300 ancient cuneiform tablets in Amarna, Egypt. We call these the Tel El Amarna letters. So 300 letters. And they're written by Canaanite chieftains to the Egyptian pharaoh. And we know which one. It's Amenhotep III. And um, these uh, Canaanite chieftains are begging, pleading with the king of Egypt to please send troops because there are these people who are overrunning the land of Canaan. By the way, uh, a couple episodes ago, we talked about the Hittites, and people said, oh, there's no such thing as Hittites. Some of these letters are from Hittite chieftains, so this is just so great. And, and they're begging the Pharaoh to, to send troops for help because these people who are called the Habiru, like Hebrew, right? Or sometimes Kabiru. Um, these Habiru people, the Kabiru people, are, are overrunning the land of Canaan. And so the usual academy position, you know, uh, the academic world tries to date these letters from Canaanite chieftains to a couple decades after Joshua should have died. But the date is hotly debated, and there is good reason to think that these letters are coming at exactly the time when Joshua and his people are overrunning Canaan and, and their conquests. So this is so great. And um, also, the, the way it fits is just uncanny. So these frantic appeals from Canaanite chieftains because the Habiru are coming. And a letter number 162 in this collection quotes the king of Egypt. So, you know, it's being written by a Canaanite chieftain, but the Canaanite chieftain is, is complaining, I know that the king of Egypt has said this, and, and this is what the letter says uh, from the king of Egypt. You know, indeed, I do not desire to go heavily, that is, you know, to engage in battle. <clears throat> I do not desire to go heavily against the whole land of Canaan. So they're appealing to the king for help, and he's not coming. And by the way, we have no evidence that the king of Egypt got involved, uh, no matter how desperate their pleas were. Letter 256 specifically mentions the names Joshua and Benjamin. You know, they're coming. <clears throat> they're, they're invading. They're overrunning Canaan. Letter 286 is great. It has a Hittite king, which is so great, right? A Hittite king um, in Jerusalem, and his name is uh, Abdi Heba. And he's begging for help from Pharaoh. And here's what he says. You do not listen to me when I say that the king's lands are going to ruin. Let the king send archers because the Habiru plunder all the lands of the king. Why do you love the Habiru and hate the regions? <laughs> so he's appealing for help. And the king of Egypt says, I'm not getting involved with that. And so this, this fits so nicely into the conquest of Joshua. And... Um, there is an archaeologist historian named Ralph Kyle, and he was talking about his frustration with people trying to date this at some other time so it doesn't fit Joshua's conquest. And here's what he says. He says, all I can comment is that, again, what facts there are support the authenticity of the scriptures whenever any proof at all is available. Here, once again, the critics fail to make points. Proof, when it comes, never favors the critics. Not that disproof ever stops them. I fear that too many of them will be dead in hell when their mouths are finally stopped. <laughs> well, 
I'm not sure I would have said it just that way, but that does seem to be the feeling of the Academy. Anything but the Bible, you know, even though it fits really, really well. All right, well, our great life lesson today goes back to this idea of unfulfilled potential. The people in Israel could have conquered the land. They didn't, but it was because they were reluctant to obey. And our unfulfilled potential, all of us as Christians, as believers, our unfulfilled potential comes from our reluctance to obey, to walk in the Spirit, as the New Testament terms it. We're not going to follow God's leading. When he says, you really can overcome, for example, your temper, you can Go conquer that. You can overcome that. I mean, not perfectly, right? Nobody is perfect. But you can be characteristically temper-free uh, to overcome your lust, to overcome your love of money, to overcome your fears, to overcome your social skills deficits. You can do that. The Lord will help you do that. And you should fulfill your potential. Conquer the land. Conquer the whole land. And so that should be our prayer, that today we're going to uh, commit to following God's leading moment by moment and to begin to conquer the land, all the land, to fulfill our potential. So I hope you'll pray right along with me for that as I pray out loud. Will you do that? Father God, today we want to say yes to you. Oh, yes to you in everything, to conquer all the land. If you say we can conquer our, our temper or our lust or our love of money or overcome these uh, social skills deficits, if you say that it's land we should overcome, then by your help, we will overcome it. Today, we're saying yes to you in everything. We will take the initiative to conquer our land, and we ask that you will help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, God bless you today. Thank you for joining me for day 76 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast, and I sure hope I get to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.